Okay. Thank you very much uh, on, a, on a great day. Uh, I've been uh, in and out of the virtual conference and there's been some awesome talks uh, with a lot of information. So glad to uh, be part of it and everything else. So thank you for the invitation and everything. So um, when I first saw the opportunity to think about what would I tell people um, with that, I thought about my toolbox because it's something that um, uh, used to be that was what was your trade craft. That was what you were, was your secret sauce. That was what a lot of things that people wanted to do. Um, and then when I started looking, you kind of look out there and there is a flood of different tools and everything else around that. So started putting a little thought process into that and saying, okay, what, what do I use and how do I use it? And sometimes I use different tools than a lot of other people use. And sometimes everybody's using the same thing. Um, and then in my world of being a CISO, I have this thing called budget and I can buy lots of really expensive tools. And sometimes they work really good. And sometimes the the open source world or the free tools work much even better than these. So it's kind of this world of what do I want to use and how do I want to use it is a lot of the cases that's there. So um, to quote uh, American philosopher uh, Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I've dated myself. I've been doing this way longer than there. Um, and one of his things was he's got an ultimate set of tools. It can, I can fix it. If I have the right tools, I can do just about anything uh, along those lines. And I also have like two quotes from my parents. One, my dad always used to tell me, with a great set of tools, you can break anything. And he wasn't talking about software tools at that point in time. <laughs> his regular tools. Yes, you can break things very easy if you have the right tools. You can also fix things, but in a lot of times, you're more along the lines of breaking things. My mom always used to tell me, why do I need 15 screwdrivers or 12 pairs of pliers? Uh, and it was always one of the things. You need different things to be able to deal with those functions. Uh, and sometimes the easiest access to, to a thing and a unique one, and it may be a favorite one or something along those lines. And then Batman is just a rich guy with cool tools. Um, and and, the, and the, the side of it is I'm not really a Batman fan. I'm more of a Punisher person and people that know me know that all too well. But it's the same idea is that tools allow you to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do whether it's speed, whether it's complexity, whether it's th those ideas around that. And this is why this talk has shifted around a couple of things. So a little about me, uh, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. I'm CISO from Motorola. I've been CISO for like 10 years, which usually in CISO years I should have died long ago. Uh, I do have a crazy family uh, on that side of it. Um, and uh, it's all part of the fun um, that's there. Um, I have all sorts of stories about my daughter's understanding CAPTCHA, uh, my daughter's understanding your password um, questions and why they're stupid and why they can answer each other's password questions to reset each other's accounts. Um, I had an awkward conversation with uh, one of the vice principals at one of my daughter's schools where she had uh, bypassed the um, app control library on her iPad and loaded a game on her iPad that she was playing in math class. Uh, I gave her a fist bump when we were talking to the vice principal when I learned about it, that she had detention for that reason. Vice principal didn't find that funny. Um, I did, but uh, I had to explain what I did and how this was a good thing. She still didn't get it, um, that's there. I've done this a really long time. Uh, I've done corporate, I've done startups, I've done a lot of different functionalities. I've written tons of articles. You can go out and Google. Uh, here's one on dealing hacking the White House via wireless. Here's another one on wireless security and retail space back in 2000, long before a lot of the Wi-Fi stuff was going on. And it's, it's continuing out there in the area and along with the process that's there. Um, I'm a lot of Cisco by day, CISO by day. I work for some of the largest companies. I chase bad people most of my day. 
uh, they're trying to do bad things to my organization and other organizations around the world. So uh, I spend a lot of time in doing some of this stuff. So some of my approaches are around speed. Some of my approaches are around, hey, what can I look at really quickly and determine things that are around that. Um, I'm a speaker conference chunky fanboy, whatever you want to call it. I'd like to attend conferences around that. Uh, if you know a cool conference, you can tweet me at, at SecRich or my contact details are in here. Uh, you can get me um, on that side of it. Um, I, li I like to attend new things. I think of conferences like restaurants. There's always a new flavor, a new way, uh, and some conferences are not for everyone. Some conferences are around there. So uh, try to attend uh, quite a few number and, and speak at a, quite a few uh, around uh, the world in a lot of cases that are there. And I'm always in search of more time because I don't have enough. I'm a security researcher by night. <laughs> and I always say, what happens at night stays at night. Um, I've been doing security research well longer than I've been CISO, uh, probably closer to 20 years. I have uh, a bunch of zero days that I've given for uh, different uh, companies and organizations around. Um, part of that, unfortunately, part of the zero days um, were many, many, many scary legal letters that I got from the places that we were giving out or I'm providing information to and saying, hey, you really need to fix this, followed by don't talk about it, never mention it, and uh, cease and desist at all activity that you're actually doing. It was a really nice thank you note, the way I looked at it, uh, maybe not so much, but that's where that kind of dealt with, with that. Um, and I always look for one of the things, I really understand FUBAR and you can, Urban Dictionary that if you need to, um, when you see it. And that's kind of where I've always got into the security things. Once I see something, I'm like, this is wrong. Let me figure out what's wrong with it. And it could be a device, it could be an app, it could be something else. So my triggers are kind of when I see something or run across something, find it, then that's how I want to actually go into it uh, that's there. So kind of the first area, and the one are a lot of the vulnerability scanners um, and, 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 and such dynamic analysis, other things that are around there. And I've really broken it down into some key areas. There's not a perfect solution. L let's be honest. Everybody has their own method and everybody has their own desire to do the scanning. So if you think it from a CISO perspective, I've got to scan millions of IP address spaces in my environment versus a very small segment. So speed, uh, flexibility, and everything else is the choice that you're looking at versus some of the other things that are there. Um, and one of the things I do like um, in a lot of cases is that um, the community additions of most of the tools that are out there are actually better than the production tools that you currently have that are being deployed. Because around the production tools, I have a different requirement. My production tool needs to eliminate as many false positives as possible and be very successful. If there's an exploitation and I tell you to exploit it, it has to exploit it and it has to do it well and it has to do it time and time and time and time again. So a lot of the things that are in the community edition, think of it as beta, they're pre before they actually go into the at regular stable version of the edition or what I get shipped as the professional versions of the tools that are actually there. So the community editions actually have a leg up in a lot of cases of these tools. Uh, and so that's why I like to use a lot of those, whether it's uh, the, the Rapid7 Nexpos or any of the other professional grade scanners typically have a community edition that you can use and limitations with that. Now, sometimes the limitations are, hey, you can scan an IP address block, you can't scan, um, I, uh, external IP addresses, et cetera, with that. And that's true. Just always remember the network address translation association you can leverage at the same time on devices as well. So um, it, the, there's, there's ways, um, but one of the things is that it's, it's the area to be focused with uh, that's there. 
Um, I'm a big fan, uh, and I was glad the previous conversation was talking about Burp Suite. Uh, that's a long time in my toolbox. If you can afford a professional, ver the pro version is, is really sharp, really supported, big community effort. I think that's one of the big things that I look at for a lot of my tools. They fall into the same community standards that are there, is that there is a community supporting the tools. There's pages of, of functions. People are going in and out of that. And I think that's one of the key areas that are around things that are around that. One of the big things that I start looking for are specialties and some of the other stuff that's around that. So things that can run in other platforms. In other words, I don't necessarily need a Windows or a Linux box every time I want to be able to do a tool or someplace else. That's why I like things like Python and Java uh, capabilities because I can run them in a lot of different locations uh, and get closer to where I need to run them from or in some cases, I'm already inside the area that I need to run them around that. Uh, that includes like Vega, which is Java based. Um, and then some of the load basing, if I've got to do a lot of things, because sometimes you come back and I'm like, where do you start? Uh, how do I want to look? What am I looking for? Or I've got a lot of load that I want to process, so very deep uh, websites and everything else. Some of the stuff that's really big and bulky, as I refer to it as, um, Google's Skipfish tool does a really good process function. It's really lightweight on the CPU and everything else is not trying to kill you, but does handle a lot of, a lot of app side uh, functionality that's around there uh, in some of those other ones. Um, and then you can go back, I'll go down at the, the other side of it is sometimes uh, people like GUIs. Other times, people like command line. Um, it's a choice, it's a perspective. Sometimes the command line people are just happy with. Uh, other times people are trying to want a GUI just because it's, it's more configurable and some of the other options that are there. It's a preference and there's not a right or wrong answer for it. But, and some of the time, a lot of people look at the other features and that's what I typically do on, on some of these areas. If I've got things that are in JavaScript, I maybe use Grabber to look at it to look for possible exploitation or something in Ajax that's around that. Uh, I do, my programming is not the best in the world. I spend a lot of time in Python. Um, and so a lot of my sets and everything else are around Python just because that's where I'm either coming from or going to in a lot of cases uh, for what I'm actually trying to do in some of those areas. Um, one of the things I see in my environment is the vulnerability scanners that are people are using against me. Uh, and it, a lot of times it's ActionX, uh, some of the open bash stuff, or Nico, uh, some of the proxies and everything else. Um, the side of that is a lot of these have distinct signatures uh, in the packets and the way they craft the packets so that they're tagged and says, hey, this is a Nessus scanner and it gets picked up and it either gets picked up by the firewall, picked up by the WAF or picked up by the intrusion detection system on the other side of it. So that's three different things that can do something to you. Now, one of the key areas that a lot of people don't understand is that on the enterprise side and everything else, a lot of organizations are using vulnerability blocking rules on firewalls and vulnerability blocking rules in WAF type of environments that are there. So that if there's a vulnerability that's there and you may find it because of a versioning issue or something else that's popping up and says, oh, this is an old version of PHP 5.5. Oh, okay, I know exactly what to do now. And now you try and nothing happens. Uh, I've, trust me, I've fold enough red team exercises doing that, that it, it's aggravating because you're like, why is it there? It, everything sh says that this is a legit uh, issue. And it is, but it's being blocked. In other words, it's, it's stopping the firewall or the proxy or something is stopping the tool that's actually going through that. Um, it doesn't say the vulnerability doesn't exist. So you, some of that can be submissions and things like that. Other times though, it's like, okay, how do I bypass how these things are stopping? 
Well, sometimes the way that the vulnerability is, is being trying to be exploited is sometimes a common tool, sometimes some proof of concept software and everything else. They literally took that same proof of concept software, wrote the blocking rules for it, wrote it identical for that particular function, and there it goes with that and it stops it. So anything that's being generated at that will always stop it. So it's time to chain it up. You add some padding, you change some of the other stuff, or use something uh, similar to SCAP, uh, SCAPI or something else, one of the uh, network protocols, or change enough things around it to do the resubmission of it so that it looks different, or put it into uh, HTTPS environment for some of these stuff, or SSL, so they, they don't see it, they're not, breaking it so necessarily some of the stuff comes all the way across in some of those areas. But a lot of times, um, just because you're not getting a positive result does not mean the vulnerability is not exploitable. It's just a matter of taking the time to go back and figure a way around the obstacle that's actually there. So a lot of times when people are looking for things, they're looking for things and they're overlooking this to go, oh, well, this wasn't exploitable, so it's not a problem or this is that, and that's not always the case. Some of them are very distinct that this actually something is bad. It's just the fact that the firewalls are doing what they're designed to do, or, and that's their mitigating controls, but it's time to move on uh, of, from that, fix the problem that's there, uh, because many times these are just bypassable, I don't wanna say by trivial functionality, but once it's found, it's usually pretty, pretty common and easy to be able to bypass in a lot of the cases that are there. Now, one of the areas that gets into this is, is what in size toolbox do you actually need? Because in some cases, uh, standing up uh, some of these tools, like a good example is OpenVAS and some of the other ones, very expansive tool, very capable tool, very open, and it's arena that's actually there, but it's a bunch of different components all tied together. A lot of the open source tools start getting into, well, here's my engines, here's my databases, here's my reporting system, here's my console, and you, you end up with like, I need like six separate servers, or lo and behold, I can run them all in one giant VM environment, which kind of defeats some of the purposes of around this. But the idea behind that though, unfortunately, is that it's complicated to upgrade, it's complicated to maintain, and it's complicated to, to do some of the environments that are there. But they're very powerful in some of those areas. So um, there's some advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is once I put some of these tools up and let them rip, uh, they inject and work with multiple sets of tools along this thing. So it's kind of one shot and then study. And then I can make a plan based upon some of those other capabilities that are around there. Uh, a lot of times multiple tools allows me, rapid scan's a good example of this, I can deduct the false positives. So I'm not spending a bunch of time on a lot of different things that are around there. Uh, on one side or another side that says, hey, is this a, I'm chasing things that say, hey, here's a false positive, here's not a false positive. It's like if two tools say that there's an issue, the likelihood that it is an issue, very, very, very high um, on that. Um, a lot of times the information gathering and the other capabilities around that are some of the better results. Sometimes you, you have tools that are like, I'm gonna go out and get the network components of this. I'm gonna go out and look at DNS and I'm gonna go out and look at the application side of the house and I'm gonna do this simultaneously. The problem is that as you move some of this stuff um, around that and then some of those areas, how do I bring those together to do better? And that's one of the key things. A lot of times when you have these multiple sets of tools, it's kind of like, oh, I want to look at a port scan first before I go try all the ports to see what's there. Uh, it's the same kind of stair step scenario is that I need portions of this data and how do I get that data and leverage and use that. Um, and that's part of, the, part of the arena and part of the process that goes into a lot of that that's just around that, that scenarios in a lot of cases that's there. So one of the things there are a lot of universal tools just due to the age of things that are out there. 
So part of the issue is that, yes, you're gonna have tools that have been expanded and expanded and expanded. The community effort can make tools do a lot of different things. Uh, great examples, Nmap and Metasploit have been around for years. And they're, they're super popular and they're super uh, easy to find information that are based around a lot of those things. And I think it's one of the key areas uh, that's there that allows you to, to deal with some of those. Now, I will be the first to say that out of, in, in all these tools, a lot of those, the, the MMAP Metasploit, Nessus is another one, uh, the proxies, whether it's the RAT, Pharos, and some of the other uh, um, scenarios that are out there, Burp Suite's another one, that you, how people use the tool is very different. And uh, there's a lot of web information, a lot of Twitter uh, functions that are there. There's tons of different pieces of sources of out there to be able to leverage and use that uh, to go after some of these things. Because I would say that in a lot of these tools, most people use maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30% of the capabilities of the tool. And you can talk to somebody that's used it for years and tell them, hey, have you looked at this? And they're like, I didn't know it did it. And that's a lot of the things. You learn something new in a lot of cases uh, that's there uh, because it's, it's just that, it's just that way is you're typically using your same set and you're moving through um, and processing the data and finding out and going through that and you're using only a small portion of it just because that was what you leveraged and used when you first started or that's what you're familiar with as you go through that uh, and they do change they do get better and better uh, as things go on so it's kind of the vice grip model of tools is like hey i can make a universal function that's actually there and, and, and out there. So one of the ones that I always like is like Nmap with the Nmap scripting engine. So a good example of that is this is a scripting language based on Lao that basically allows you to script up what you're trying to do in a lot of these areas. So by default, Nmap comes with about over 600 scripts um, only about 150 are enabled by default. <laughs> um, so you only have 150 that are sitting out there. Uh, the rest um, need to be invoked directly. So there's only about 150 that are used by the application. The rest of them you have to go invoke directly on that. And here's a bunch of my favorites to actually use in a lot of cases that's there. Uh, and they all do different things from enumerating your server path environments to DNS enumeration, uh, looking for your dev, your prod, your pre-prod, uh, your backup, all these different things. It will try to look for this in your DNS to go look for other areas to focus in around that. The same thing for mapping of sites, doing a layout, uh, with that, looking at your firewalls, what's in front of me that I'm going to worry about? Is there anything in front of me uh, that's there? Uh, all those different things uh, pull to that. There, there are some of the other stuff that's around uh, dealing with vulnerabilities and, and doing vol scans. And so, um, vulners and vol scan are are two scripts for Nmap that looks for CVEs, they use a database. One uses one locally, one will go out and pull out the database. They're basically looking for common CVEs and see if they can actually pull and look at for those that are there. These are great pieces of software to give you a cursory look a lot of times when you're starting to look. If I got to scan once, why do I need to scan multiple times around portions of this to be able to do it? This also goes back to looking for your web application firewalls. Is there one? What's the fingerprint? Is it uh, uh, something in the cloud? Is it something on prem? A lot of those areas that are around there. Looking for scripting for errors. We saw or in the earlier uh, presentation where sometimes error codes divulge lots of different things. So the same kind of error is looking for what is available on the sites um, that's there. There plenty of scripts for applications. There's plenty of brute force scripts. I don't know of anything that's not 
a brute forceable function that's actually out there. Um, and you can always do a script help for the particular script. Uh, and it will download the, the script, tell you what it actually does uh, in, in and of itself. Um, I, again, uh, you can look at the uh, documents at nmoc.org for NSE. It's kind of the source of truth. Uh, there's a hashtag on Twitter side called Discovering NSE, which is, is a great place to go find what community editions of people have thrown out looking for some of the same things. Because again, it's one of the things that people, it's easy, quick, painless, and a lot of people already did your work for you. Uh, and so a lot of times these are great if I'm trying to look at an app or I'm trying to brute force or trying to look at something, these give you great ideas of how to situate this thing. So I don't spend time having to look at the communication that's there, rewrite what's actually there, bring it out, it's already done. So a lot of times you can bring in a lot of pieces of the data that's actually there, that's along the line that's there. So one of my quick areas that I deal with and I spend a lot of time with sandboxes just due to the malware components of this, but in, in doing so you always discover that, hey, guess what? These are great for looking for binary executables, uh, regular sites, websites as well, because I pull back the JavaScript, I pull back all the content is that. So in some of the cases that's there, and also the sandboxes are doing my work for me. So if I don't want to look like I'm coming from where I, I wanna come from, I wanna come from someplace else, these are a great opportunity to have something launch uh, on that side of it. Um, there's always the build one versus buy uh or free ones um from my perspective the build one uh they are uh one of the standards um that are there um but uh cuckoo is one of the containerization vms it's hard to upkeep and keep up to date uh, just in its environment. I, I highly suggest using containers for this rather than an actual server. But it, it's one of the things that, yeah, they're great, but it's there's a lot of upkeep involved in a lot of sandboxing uh, that's there. Because again, oh, well, I need Windows 10 or I need a Linux or I need an iOS or I need an Android. Uh, emulator and then oh I need this version or I need this version or I need this version so a lot of those you end up with okay there's more and more of these and there's a lot of stuff that's there uh, around that side of it that's there so uh, there's a lot of community editions slash free ones that are there they have limitations so it's like hey you can submit 10 binaries to us every uh, month or there's a small subset of there. Some of them allow for pay, some of them allow for research. There's a lot of different variations along the same lines with that. Um, and there's a lot of specifications. So some of them are uh, cross-platform. So I have iOS, Android, Windows, different versions, Windows 7, Windows 10, uh, Windows with Office, Windows with Adobe, et cetera, with that. Some of them are very specific. I'm looking for other pieces of that. So some of the ones that I, I like and the reports on to the right on here. And, and again, you think about this, these are guides around what things are coming out. So it tells me, especially around applications, what kind of controls are in there? Are you operating at administrative levels? Do you self-promote? Do you do some of these things that as somebody looking for exploitation, it's the perfect place to go really quick, really find, I need this, and now I know my target rich environment of like here is where I want to actually go. Um, some of the other versions will have, um, code analysis sections that are there. So as it comes in, it breaks out the code and does a visualization on the code analysis. And sometimes you can see the, I don't know what you want to call it, band-aids or patches <laughs> that people put in because you see all this all of a sudden you see this injection point hanging off the side of the code tree and you're like what is this and that's a good place to start and look and go what is going on here because this doesn't look like this should be here uh, and it shouldn't uh, it should have been in that but they just put it that way which usually means hey there's more things for you to look at at this point in time 
Um, so I it's typically in the free and buy side of the world, uh, joesecurity.org is a good class platform. Hybrid analysis is using Falcon um, on that side. IMAS is an Android specifically one. Um, one of the big things that come up is kind of the innovation side of, uh, of sandboxing. So, um, and Teaser is another great one that does DNA and family classification. That's really useful for malware because it says, hey, we've seen this before and this is the family that's there with, but the same thing can be from a DNA classification for vulnerabilities and some of the other stuff. Hey, we've seen this before. Um, and, and so some of that DNA and that perspective gives some insight into binaries and some of the other stuff. Um, there's another one that's any run, which legitimately is any dot run. Um, it's another malware. It has probably the best interaction capability because I don't have to script anything. I don't have to let the sandbox do it. I can actually interact the VM at the same time that stuff is there. So if I need to click on something or I come to a window that says, please enter in the following code, you're not left with most sandboxes will get there and go, well, I don't know what to do. I'm waiting for an interaction and there's no way to interact with a lot of the stuff that's there. So it hangs up. So you only get like a third of the way through something for it actually running. Or if I'm trying to look at parsing or some of the other capability, hey, Adobe is great, but guess what? It's all about when you open up the PDF, not when you just launch it. And so that's portion of file open. I need that capability. The any run product does a great job of pulling that information in, uh, allowing you to interact with it and doing a very nice report of the data that's actually there, providing you with the details that are actually there along the same lines um, that's there. So one of the other key areas that I, 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 I like is, uh, Static code and people are like, well, who likes to look at other people's code or some compiler code that people wrote? Well, no one, because I can tell you no one likes to look at my code. Um, but in a lot of cases that it, it is, you, you do need to look at things, but looking's different. Um, and this is one of the things that unfortunately and in the world of tools, the, the corporations have an advantage of this. The, the static code tools are really good uh, with that. And, and they find a lot of the consumer side of it that's there, uh, or no, the, 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 the business side of it. They find a huge amount of, uh, of tools that are out there. Um, there's big names, uh, brands of it, and they do an awesome job and they have different levels of services that are there. But they cost money for a lot of things. But if people were actually using them a lot, we would have a harder time finding bugs that are there. And that's not the case in a lot of cases with that. So uh, a lot of times, the problem is that these code tools, uh, part of the software development life cycle and everything else, were plugged in after the code base had already been established for a while. So maybe you had 50,000 lines of code, really small amount of code base. But out of those 50,000 lines, there may be 10,000 lines of code that need to be changed to fix that code base. But why? Because, well, it was run on version three. So there were three versions of this to go through. And now, okay, we almost need to rewrite part of the whole app to be able to do it. No one wants to do that because they're like, hey, we need to have version four out in the thing. So this fix what we want to fix and go back to it. So a lot of the things that you start looking at look great on the outside and everything else. And then when you do something on the inside, it almost, you're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Uh, and you run into that uh, time and time again. So I can tell you that these tools are not lever being leveraged and used in a lot of cycles uh, that are out there. They're getting more, don't, don't get me wrong, they're getting more and more, but there's still all this legacy code that's never gonna change, never gonna work into these environments that are, is, is perfectly exploitable 
uh, that's there. Now they do win on the capabilities. Uh, all those tools that are out there are definitely out there. That's there. Um, there's two lists that I like to use. Um, a lot of the static code people, uh, I, I like to say that um, find tools that you like the output of. So some of the tools they output comes out very straightforward. Other of the tools try to be cutesy and hey, we will, we will add some extra pieces of data from some CVEs and some other stuff. Other tools are like, oh, well, we'll try to give you some ideas on how to fix it. And then other tools are pretty much just raw. It's like bad uh, with that. So uh, depends on what kind of output you want and, the, and what languages you're trying to process this code in from the source code side of it. So sometimes uh, you're dealing with very, very normal classifications. Other times there's some abstract function that people are writing in that you want to be able to leverage or use, well, you need to have a static code analysis for portions of that in some of the cases that are there. So uh, here's two links that are really good for the tools. Uh, choose accordingly and choose more than one because again, some of the code bases, uh, doing too much on some of the things, my preference is like I'd rather have a tool that did three separate good languages that are there versus something that's trying to do 20 because at that point in time you're not you're not you're not doing a lot of due diligence on on the area you spread yourself way too wide in some of the areas that are there now one of the things that you like to do for anything is always look for keywords uh, that are there uh, so finding the keywords typically relates to problem. Um, if you see these keywords, there could be potentially, this is either a vantage point for you to take a closer look, or this is a vantage point that there's a problem that you just found. Uh, figuring out how to take advantage of that problem is a different story. But things in code that say things like debug, debug or trace or, or method equals get or location, uh, all those times when you see that you're like, okay, location means you're trying to do location and no one's going to shorten that. They put it in the code as, hey, here's my element that's there. So anytime you're popping the location, you're going to be like, oh, where are they going to get this? How are they doing this? Uh, a lot of the same things. Same with debug and trace and that is like a lot of the stuff was left in as part of the value, as part of their normal process and it's still there. So you can take a look at same for a database with execute or delete or queries, uh, creating objects, uh, getting strings, uh, data adapters. The same for input validation. Hey, uh, file reader, file writer, Java IO file. Each of these are usually specific that's there. The same thing goes for output validation. Hey, if I'm encoding the URL, I'm encoding the HTML, uh, all those pieces tell me things. Uh, oh, I'm writing a response. Great. This tells me where I want to look for. Here's file creation at the point. Same with password. Uh, and you would figure they would you everybody would code with something different than password. No, everybody codes when uses password as its default with that. Uh, impersonate, get local host, figure out where you're at. Here's the host name that I'm looking for. The same with session. IDs and cookies, looking for things. Uh, uh, HTTP only is one of the best that's like, oh man, you're killing me with some of this stuff. Or looking for SSL, okay, why would you now, if you weren't always encrypted, why are you now changing to encryption? What are you about to do that you don't want anybody to see? And again, look at code and think about it of what's actually being done. You don't have to necessarily understand to figure out this, but looking at these snippets and finding those very early on are usually the keys to looking and finding where things actually are versus the other side where I start at line one and I get to one line 50,000 and I've got a headache and I've, I'm just awash because no one really likes looking at other people code because I don't understand the method to the madness that's going on. So using keywords and searching for certain of those things, whether it's encryption or error codes or data transmission, gives me the idea that these are important areas that I wanna focus in on, because this is the likelihood where mistakes have been made that I can take some exploitation around and use and leverage those. 
Some of the tools will do this very quickly for you. You can do it yourself, just keyword searching through some of the stuff that's actually there, whether it be HTML or regular source code or Java, JavaScript in these environments that are there uh, that are leveraged or used. So utilizing keywords are really good as part of the process that's there. Now, why would I, if I couldn't talk about mobile, I would be kind of a shame. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's certain things I can and cannot talk about as we're a mobile provider that I, I don't want to say, but as far as mobile, everything is an app. Everything is going to an app. Even if it's a stupid web browser that's wrapped as an app, it's still an app. People are wanting applications. The businesses that are developing applications want application versus website because it gives them a feeling that they're there. So more and more things are going to applications uh, that are there. Uh, commercial tools, really good. Uh, we use one called Now Secure that is great at doing all app, uh, mobile app and doing it. To do it correctly, you have to be on the hardware that's there, which kind of now becomes a barrier to entry to a lot of people. Uh, because guess what, I need to have like six different phones uh, and everything else to be able to do this and have different versions of OS and some of them I need to have six carrier accounts, uh, etc. because Wi-Fi doesn't necessarily work all the time. Uh, and, and so a lot of those things become problems for a lot of people when they start doing mobile testing and then again, having test rigs for Apple uh, for mobile phones is not the easiest thing to develop uh, and there's a lot of stuff that's around there so that's one of the key areas um, that's there now one of the key things to look for uh, on, on on mobile um, and the platforms that are actually there is look at the server and application checks first place to go for any of these because these are always the ones that are uh, messed up uh, for lack of a better term uh, because it's two different pieces. The server is in the cloud somewhere, running an application and everything else. The development team that was developing that code is not the people on the server side. The development people developing the app code are on the app side going, hey, we're writing this and we're mobile app developers. Uh, we're not server guys. That's, oh, that's the IT department, or that's another group that's actually there. And they're like, oh, well, it's in the cloud. We just stand this up, spin it up, put some software on here, listen to it, and then what are you sending and how are you sending it? Oh, okay, we're sending this. Okay, good to go. Easy. Uh, and unfortunately, that's part of the problem. How does authentication happen? How does a lot of the other stuff that are there? How do I log into it? Do I use something uniquely to it? Is there a CAPTCHA? portion of this that keeps from brute forcing. What happens when I send you 100,000 requests? Uh, things along those natures. And oh yes, the big thing about apps that a lot of people don't know is that I have to support old versions. It's not like a website where I just fix the server and everybody's automatically upgraded. The applications <laughs> It's up to you going and saying, yes, go ahead and do updates. And it's like, yes, 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 yes. Or if I change my permissions, follow the privacy statements, any number of things can keep you from actually upgrading one of these. Or you just never download the new ones. And you tell you told it, hey, I don't want to ever upgrade my apps that are there. And well, it has to work with that application. So that's portion of the server side that has this problem where I've got to operate on all these different variants, even if I break something, I cannot not have it talk to me in a lot of cases. So those are issues that on the server side are the, are, 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 are the easy ones to actually find in a lot of the areas. Transportation layers and ciphers, so many times, you've seen so many talks, and I'm sure there'll be more talks on this of how, hey, something's not encrypted being sent, uh, whether it's GPS locations, authentication, other things. It's getting better and better and better, but there's so many things that are still left non-encrypted. They'll, they'll, they'll do it. And a lot of people are like, why in the world of dealing with the world where everything's going encrypted end to end uh, around this, are there applications still to this date that's there? And it's part of the, it's part of the battery life. It's part of the CPU utilization of the device. 
uh, online those that there was an old idea that hey these were kind of uh, fragile devices didn't have a lot of horsepower and if I encrypt everything I, I, I suck all my battery down uh, and that does happen or if I if I encrypt everything I, I'm, I'm now impacting the performance uh, of my device and yeah that happens too uh, but it's secure so a lot of times they're they're trying to balance that performance with security side that's actually there um, business logic rules are really good to exploit on applications. And the reason why they're so good to exploit on the application side of it is they're typically the same rules that were set up for web. And it's not the same logic. And so a lot of times of like, how do I reset the account? And most of the time you hit on the reset button and it's like, it'll click out and they will send an email. Woohoo! Um, and so you see all these different things that are really designed around hey, this is the same way we did it on the web, so why can't we do it this way on the application? And those are very good around that. The same thing for like brute force is like, oh, we have, we have a captcha sitting up here, so if you start banging on this, we're gonna come back at you and make you type something in. Well, how do you do that on your application? And do you? Do you stop it? Do you not stop it? How do you do that? And those are, those are things that are not thought through. Same with permissions. Of, what permissions do I need versus what permissions do I want versus the what permissions are actually the app actually has. So they're, they're security, we always go with, hey, least privileged. Applications, unfortunately, is most of the time they're like, well, most privilege, and then we'll cut ourselves back if people yell at us or we wonder why things. Uh, and a lot of times the privileges it used to be in the old days, these were really badly done. It's like, hey, I need to be able to read and write files. And you're like, oh, no. And I was like, well, how do you expect me to take a photograph and not write it to your thing? Oh, oh, OK, OK, that's what you're doing. So they weren't really specific. But so many applications now go out and get these large scale permissions just because they're either developed poorly. That's a, usually a key sign. If you have really bad development environment, they will ask for a lot of overreaching permissions or your malware. Um, and you'll ask for overreaching permissions because you don't understand how to make this work the way you need it to work without doing the permissions or you're not in a mobile development, you're just in a regular development shop that are there. Um, a lot of times uh, code issues are pretty much normal code issues that are around there. Input validation, other things that are around that, uh, functions that are there. Memory and storage is really good to play with because a lot of times they, it's not something that's really understood by the application uh, owners or uh, uh, builders uh, because uh, most of this is stored in a SQLite database, at least on the Android side of it. Um, or other databases that are there, but I, sometimes they're stored in clear text, sometimes they're stored and they're not removed, so they're stored and left in logs, they're stored and left in cache, so when I connect to something, I'm like, here's my log file of all my connections, and oh yeah, here's the username and password that's in the log file, or here's my things that are in cache that stay there. Uh, does it change, doesn't do it. <clears throat> a lot of times things are in a debug mode uh, when people are looking for things and then and they're produced and they're still in debug mode. Someone never turned it off. It's there. Uh, information stored in the clear. Uh, when they crash, they dump everything um, around that and, and some of the other stuff that's there. Um, one of the key things to remember though is that when you start messing with applications or actually messing with the iOS or the Android uh, functions uh, that are there for the software side of it, um, you can break stuff and it don't work anymore. Really bad, bad. So sometimes you can revert back to it and other times it takes a lot to revert back to it and sometimes it's just never gonna come back. Uh, so I, tell people, please start. If you're starting in the world of mobile apps and you want to beat on something, buy used stuff, buy stuff that's cheap versus expensive stuff because uh, things will break and you will blow things up and uh, it will not come back and you will be sad uh, at the phone uh, that's there that as you see, it's just you power it on, it powers itself off. Uh, so um, that's one of the 
other areas that are there uh, that's around that. Um, IoT uh, devices. So IoT is one of these areas, brand new stuff, but it's also cool stuff. So it's all about the device in the world of IoT. And what I mean by the device is, is finding what you're trying to look for. Um, remember that these devices are designed typically to be cheap and replaceable and easy to use, which for us, hey, this is a great opportunity because cheap, easy to use, usually does not go well with security. Um, so part of the way that you look for is typically a, a kind of four different areas to do exploitation on, on uh, these IoT devices. And, and they kind of like open them up for that. One is the firmware. You don't even need the IoT device if you got the firmware with that. Sometimes the firmware is encrypted, which, uh, sorry, it's encrypted. You're stuck uh, at this. Uh, find another device, uh, typically that. Uh, you're not going to necessarily brute force encryption. You're not going to necessarily get the keys. You're not. It, it just makes things really, really difficult. It doesn't make it any more secure. It just makes finding it a much more pain in the butt to actually do. Um, if you look at the non-encrypted version, you need to extract it, analyze the firmware, uh, look for common exploits, the standard thing, it's code, understand what's there. Uh, look for back doors, connectivity, other things that are all there, strings, passwords, other things that make sense when you start looking at this stuff that you're like, aha, I found something here uh, that's there. Um, you can get it through other ways like support sites, uh, call people up, send email off, uh, I need to reset this device, how am I going to reset these tools and everything else. Those are all common steps that you can typically get and you can get some additional pieces of that. Hardware, uh, figuring out what it is. Uh, FCC ID, you can usually typically look on the ID on that, you can get a, it's got a barcode a number, a registration number with it that tells you what it is or how it's registered um, and that. Google usually has some information on that side of a MAC address will give you the manufacturer of at least the, 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 the interfaces uh, that are around that and again looking at support uh, and functionalities that's there. Um, I'm a proponent. They're cheap and easy. That means I can buy more than one and I can open them up even if it tends to violate the warranty at some point in time and we won't discuss other legal ramifications about opening up devices. But um, this there, uh, the screws are hidden nine times out of ten under rubber pads. I always say use a lighter and a big pin. Uh, simply due to the fact that you can make any screwdriver that you want to by melting the end of a big pen and inserting it onto a screw. Do not do this at home <laughs> or use at your own WESC, but opening up will give you access to the PC board, which now you can look for slots, enabled slots, everything else. From a hardware standpoint, there's a lot of things that I can do on the hardware side. In other words, I can disable ports, I can not enable stuff. So even if you find a USB port that something's plugged into, doesn't mean that it's turned on and enabled by the software. Uh, and so a lot of these things that are built sometimes have those areas that are there. So look for empty slots, look for empty connectors, chips that are supposed to be there. You need a little bit of electrical engineering and other types of things to look for these connectors and understand stuff. But if you open up enough boards, uh, you start understanding, hey, I've seen this chip before, or this is memory, this is flash, okay, good. Okay, there's, some, there's my firmware, et cetera, with that. Uh, looking for things like JTAG, known chip connectors, known, known ribbon, connectors, how things are being done, known uh, network functions. So, hey, is it Wi-Fi, Bluetooth? Is it just Bluetooth? Is it something else that's all in the thing? Is there near field communications part of this? There's all these different functions that you can find out just by looking at these components because that provides you the other next areas of, well, now that I want to get there, how's this device working? Okay, I have connection and setup uh, around that? Is it a mobile app? Do I connect to it? Do I, on setup, do I have to be near it? Does it find it when it's near it? 
those kind of things. Is it looking for it because it's connected to the same network? Is it looking for it because it's broadcasting a new ID uh, that's there? How does the app find the device? How does the app start on square one with connecting and targeting that device? Because those key elements that you, once you find that, and you should always record the network traffic of that. Now you get into this, oh, now I see how this is finding it. Now I see how it's working. And now I see what it, it's on there. Is it using known protocols, universal plug and play, and some of the other ones that I can use potential exploitation because of the service that's running on that. Each one of those things provides kind of the next learning or stepping stone that gets me to the next level that's actually there. Um, you can have, oh, it's configured via a web interface. Oh, okay, so how is it configured? Is it set up for HTTPS? Is it configured for secure? Does it go to a secure standard? Or if it goes to secure, can I do it insecurely? Uh, all those different things that are around there. Look at the network traffic because it provides different pieces of it. You can use things like tools like Wireshark since you're connecting on the local side of it. You can connect all the, find all the data, easy to do. Uh, same with Android, there's key capture and some of the other ones which it spins up uh, uh, basically a VPN uh, shim port and then sends all the data to a file um, that's there. Uh, looking at clients APIs, so maybe it requires a client to be downloaded or an app to be downloaded on your PC. Those are even better because there's like, okay, there's a trust issue with the client and the server on the other side. And so it's like, oh, well, what do I, do a secret handshake? Do I do some other things that are around some of those areas? And some of that actually comes into some of those that are there. The same with the radio. Is it Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, near field, Bluetooth, uh, um, Zigbee, uh, using SDRs to find the data, looking how it's talking around this. Again, there's expenses associated with that. And many times you don't necessarily have to go under to the radio side to figure out how things are set up. Now, Dealing with hardware kind of has some of the same focus. You need to know some things about electronics to understand how things are there uh, to be able to exploit. But it may provide links to the software side because it's not just all the hardware. It's software running on that. So what software and how is it running and how is it talking is imperative to that. I always tell people, okay, go talk to people at the hardware labs uh, at a lot of the cons where you have a lot of people doing really cool hardware stuff, uh, usually the badges and some of the other people just bring up stuff, find out where things, sites, websites they looked at, how would you find the, a chip and some of the other stuff and they can have some great ideas behind things. Uh, that are there. We're no longer in the world where I come from the world where they would literally take PC boards and drop them in epoxy so that you could not see the board layout and you could not see the chips that were actually being used. That's gone away because it's cost. So hardware is becoming cheaper and yes, most of the time you can brutally open the boards. The chips are not washed off so you can't tell what they actually are or anything else all the stuff is just there because it's all contract-based manufacturing in a lot of cases again hardware is same thing firmware operating systems that are there and remember when it's on a hardware device it's never updated and i literally mean that many of these devices never go out and download new updates when they're starting to work iot devices are a little different hardware stuff no, it's still running this ancient version of Windows Embedded 8.1 uh, in some of the cases. So just remember that on a lot of cases. So there's a lot of areas that are there specifically around hardware. You got to do it. A lot of these things, low level protocols that are being used to share and traverse data typically are never designed for any kind of authentication. They were never designed to be connected. A lot of this stuff is how old this hardware actually is. And where is this hardware originated at? Is it something new that's bolt-on? In a lot of cases, TVs are a great example of a bolt-on hardware, because they're basically, hey, it used to be a TV. You plug cable in, hey, it showed a picture. Now it's like, hey, we have Netflix apps, we have Hulu apps, we have all these apps that are basically a board that's plugged into the TV that goes, okay, here's how we do this. And so in that bolt-on, you know those two systems don't necessarily communicate at certain levels. So focus on the system that is the bolt-on component of that, not basically something that's been manufactured around that. 
Um, and the conventional side of it is the same thing of um, encryption apps, replay attacks. Hey, if I, something worked once, it will always usually work again, unfortunately. Uh, timeouts are always key. If I'm authenticated, when do I not get authenticated anymore? Uh, a lot of times it's like, once you get authenticated, you're authenticated forever, uh, which is good. Now I just need to find out how that works. So, and the same thing goes for web permission, bugs, injections, uh, configuration startups are all parts of that uh, because those are key when it's not, when it knows nothing, how does it learn everything? And how is it going to configure? And that's an easy way to go in and dive into some of these things. Network services, again, going with the hardware, always outdated, always buggy, always not working very well. A lot of times brute forcing does wonders for this. Um, clients are still the same thing. Trusting APIs and current connection uh, that are around there. Choose cheap hardware. Expensive hardware sucks uh, because when you break it, it, you, you're like, it's not a toaster. Uh, you're like, okay, now I need to go buy another one uh, in a lot of cases that are there. So I would like to thank everyone, uh, especially Bug Crowd and the rest of the folks uh, on that side of it. So I, I'm glad uh, I was able to present and everything else and hope uh, some folks got uh, a little bit of information around it. Thanks again, guys. Thank you so much, Richard. I really appreciate you um, giving such a great and thorough talk for the community. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. All right, so we will um, get our next speaker set up here. If you have any questions for Richard, um, please feel free to tweet at him. He's at S-E-C Rich, Sec Rich on Twitter. Um, and also tweet at bug crowd using hashtag it takes a crowd. That's where we have all the conversation for level up up there on Twitter. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Richard. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'll be hanging out in, in the Twitch stream for a little bit. So if you need anything, uh, feel free to, to, to step up on that side of it. So thanks again. I really enjoyed. Awesome. Thank you.